Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 33, Britain versus the Saxons. Last week, we talked about how the Saxon elements entered into the country of Roman Britain, initially at first likely as local federate brought in to guard and look after specific areas, specific sites. We talked about the Belgic example last week. Then they come in in much greater numbers, again, probably on a federate agreement, at this point influenced by the problems that the local British communities are having as the Roman military has now abandoned them at the end of the 4th century. Uh, this group comes in probably with families. It doesn't just come in as a military unit, but it probably brings its families. It becomes a tribal group because federate were not just simply uh, militia. They could also be families and actual whole groups brought into the Roman structure. And there had been a long history of Germanic influence on the structures of the Roman military and Roman administrative machines, so this wouldn't seem unnatural to the British population. Interestingly, though, I think we have to also note that as this happens, we start to see the effects of it on the population. We see the effects of combined material being found together, so you have sites where German and British uh, material is found cultural evidence, burial evidence, different things of that nature. We start to see more pagan influence in the country at this stage. We also see a settlements that become very Anglo-Saxon. They are not purely uh, British settlements that were then converted. These are actually very Germanic settlements in the expansion of the Germanic people and population in Britain. This would go back again to the idea that the influence of the genetic code of the British people up until modern day is influenced by this influx. And are we talking great rafts of population? We're not talking like a million people moving into Britain. We're talking probably in the low 10 to 15,000 that could start this influence. Because all it takes is some intermarriage, intermingling, and all of a sudden you have a large population, particularly with birth rates being higher at that time period. Also influencing things are possible plagues, possible problems with food supplies, with droughts, with various other things. Now all of a sudden tipping the scales on the powers that be. You don't have the same kind of trade system in place because of the breakdown of other Roman communities across Gaul and in Spain, which would have been major trading partners for the Roman British up till that point. As this influence starts to change and shift, as I said, the, the conflict last week we started to talk about was between the Saxons who were brought in, the Anglo-Saxons who were brought in, who were probably uh, tribal in nature, probably poor, uh, agriculturally driven, much different than the Romano-British who are centered around cities. The Civitas is very important in Roman culture. So the idea of settlement within the Roman community, the idea of villas, in the countryside and kind of what they mean and in general just the romanization of the culture meant that when the arrival of these germans came they didn't do what the previous version had done and as we talked about they started to set up their own communities their own villages their own tons their own towns uh, and these were different than what the british were used to they didn't speak the same language they called them different names they even called the british different names they started to call them things like welsh or welsh uh, foreigners strangers the intermingling of the groups meant that there was a higher population all of a sudden and even if they were still working to try and defeat other invaders this balance of power between these two groups could have been the beginnings of the problems that would come later on. And we do know that within about 30 years, there had been several battles fought. We know that when Germanicus comes to Britain to try and drive out Pelagianism, uh, he also runs into and carries out a battle which is very uh, legendary in its, in its writing, uh, fighting against the local Saxon communities. And trying to defend the local Christian British people. All sources talk about this. This is not just one person. So obviously it was something that happened. Likely Germanicus, being as he was originally a Roman uh, 
administrator had some knowledge of military, had some understanding of how to lead troops, probably didn't need God and his angels to come throw fire upon the Saxons to beat them. Uh, but having that extra help probably had a lot to do with it. And we have from about 429 till 441, a flipping of warfare. And at this point, we end up with the possible arrival of Ambrosius Aurelianus, better known to the Welsh as Emrys Wedleg. His influence as a former uh, Roman aristocrat of some variety, they talk about his parents having worn the purple, which basically means that they would have been someone important in the Roman leadership. He is conceived at this point to have become a part of the group that was fighting the Saxons. Uh, before this, Gildas describes what goes on as effectively you have three distinct experiences for the British people. One, they are defeated or in some way unite with the Saxons, likely through marriage, through uh, peasants who didn't want to fight, didn't want to go to war, who, who found that the Roman leadership was useless to them. Uh, it could be that whole tribes went over to the Saxons uh, and because it was perceived as being the right thing to do. There's a number of different things that could explain what went on, but that's one of the conclusions. It also could be that in the wars that were fought, a lot of people were killed, thus emptying out certain areas. Uh, certainly, we, we have evidence that some Sivatas have a lot less usage after this point, uh, and this could come down to some of this. Uh, he also says that people fled into the mountains, uh, which if you think about it from a lowland Britain perspective, means that they went into Wales uh, and into Scotland and into Cornwall. So in other words, they fled to the areas which would become the last remnant of the British population that existed before the Saxons came and put their cultural stamp on the British people. The other thing he talks about is that some of them leave and try and flee to other lands. And, and this can be wrapped up by saying that there is some suggestion that this became Brittany, although the evidence has existed for a while that Brittany was probably in formation long before that. And this was more about people who fled a difficult situation trying to get away from the, from the problems that were going on and fled to go stay and live with relatives who lived in France or Gaul at the time and settled in Brittany and became a part of what becomes the British population there. Uh, so we have th all of this description going on. Uh, the wars that are fought, like I said, once Ambrosius becomes involved, the, the, it's described that the wars went back and forward. One win to the Saxons, one to the Brits, one back to the Saxons, one back to the Brits, until they get to Mount Badness at which point the British win a distinct and uh, celebrated victory, so strongly celebrated that many years after the fact, it's still celebrated by Gildas. He still brings it up, and he looks as Ambrosius as a stellar leader, someone to follow, and I think in part because he's Romanized, and Gildas seems to be much more in favor of the Roman ideals probably from a nostalgia point of view in my opinion i think it's a case of looking back through christianized latin lenses and saying oh things were so much better when we were british roman british and thus the roman british leaders were the best ones it also unfortunately sets up the translation by bede that the <laughs> romans were the only thing that kept the british from backsliding and because the romans die out in Britain, the British are basically beaten by the better people, in his case, the Anglo-Saxons, uh, because they were unfaithful to God and, and had not tried to baptize the Anglo-Saxons and basically mistreated them, which created this whole problem in the first place. Everybody's point of view is being represented here, and, and Gildas has colored all of the succeeding sources in the opinion that the Roman British were the better leaders, the, the people who won the wars, 
because of this one example, this only name he comes up with from this period. And we know nothing about this character. He's literally unknown outside of this mention by Gildas. Everything else that comes out of this later, I would argue is probably later tradition. Uh, if we look at Nennius, who has quite a lot to say about Ambrosius, I think he is doing a lot of pulling from fictionalized sources and probably as time has gone on and as the in any situation where you have a people who were the dominant people in an area and they end up being defeated by someone else there is a tendency to look back at those times before that as being something of a noble time a better time um as a case in point, this is just an example from my own local history. In Canada, we have a population in Quebec who are French Canadian, who were the dominant group in Canada for many hundreds of years. They were defeated 1759 in the Battle of Quebec and were merged into the larger British Empire at that point. For many, many years, and even I would argue now, there is a debate about this and an argument about the old ways and the old people and the, you know how much better things were before the English arrived. And even amongst historians today in Canada, this is still a discussion. And there is, to some sense of it, a lot of rose-colored glasses and a lot of idealism rather than actual reality. And we... Are colored by that. I mean, and I would say this is arguably the case in every category. We look at the old days and we think, oh, well, they were so much better than now. And in some ways, I get the impression from the writers on the British side that that is exactly what's going on. They look at the past and they color it as being wonderful and great, and the new and the current as being backsliders and people that you can't trust or can't respect because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be in this situation, so to speak. And realistically, there's so much more to it than this. And we know this just from what we've been able to understand through the DNA, through studying burials, through studying archaeology, combined with some of the historical sources, gives us a much better understanding that, that what happened with the Saxons and the invasion is not something that you can strictly put down to being, oh yeah, it's all because of this, and it's all because of that. That's why they lost. There's nothing that in set in stone or set in history that says, had this happened, they would have won. There's a lot of reasons why things happen, and there, it it goes back to the concept of the of the uh, the the big man theory, the idea that history is defined by big men, and as I've said before, typically men are the only quality, and. This concept that these big men have a uh, outdo influence on the world gets a little bit wrapped up to the point where it excuses a lot of other things that go on. I mean, if we look at Hitler as the only reason why Nazi Germany became so strong and so powerful and so, I mean, to put it in, in very religious terms, wicked, uh, then we're doing a disservice to those people that believed all this stuff that believed what the Nazis were selling, that voted them in, and all of the supporters that Hitler had that allowed him to do that. You can't, by virtue of history, say that it's just one person who caused all this. The breakdown of things generally happens long before this person enters the scene, and at most, they're just the catalyst for the end of it. And in the case of the Saxons, they weren't somehow the destroyers of Roman Britain. Roman Britain had already been beat down by a combination of things that had gone on starting even back into the 3rd century. The destabilization of the Roman Empire in the 3rd century began this whole process and created the problems, in some of which existed at the foundation of the Roman Empire. You can't look at these things and just point to it and say, yeah, that's definite. And the Saxon influence in Britain cannot just be put down to a bunch of people who decided to take on the culture of somebody else. This isn't like a bunch of British people suddenly turned around and said, hey, we're going to be Germans tomorrow. We're going to speak Germanic. We're going to use Germanic stuff. We're going to stop using all that Roman stuff. We're going to stop speaking Latin. We're going to worship different gods because, well, it's a thing to do. You know, they obviously are better. 
the reality of it is they were, this wasn't a case of some small leadership coming over and taking over a small portion of British society and then planting their ideas on them. This isn't a case of a small minority who suddenly become the majority. This isn't even the case of a small, of a mass invasion force coming in and destroying things. This is a combination of Roman idealism on how you create defense and protection and the Germanic tribe's desire to escape their own problems and to grasp onto something that looked appealing. We're going to see this go on with the Vikings. The whole reason why the Vikings come to Britain is in part because it looks good and it's wealthy and it's there and it's easy and it appears to be one of those things they can just do it's to use a terminology of a simple matter of marching. And I think in this case, the Saxons had the same sort of thing. They came to this land, they saw what they wanted, they were mistreated in the process, and probably in some ways, their own desire for this safe haven overcame probably common sense to a lesser degree. And we end up with this massive battle, which happens at the beginning of the 5th century, probably goes into the middle of the 5th century, until Ambrosius and others finally put a stop to it. And they lead to the probably the firming up of what would become the 6th century's uh, kingdoms, and the borders that would exist between the Angles and Saxons, and the areas of Britain that were still British and were no longer Roman British. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about in the next few weeks is about how the language is influenced in Britain and how a people that were generally Latin speakers also were influenced by ancient Britain and eventually what became modern Welsh. And part of it, it comes out of this cultural conflict because I think a lot of points we will see that as the cultures clashed, as conflicts occurred, much like when the Normans get here and you have a similar problem between the Saxons and the Normans and the Welsh, you're going to have this problem here as well, which is a lot of times people will suddenly start to realize, hey, there's something about this that influences us, even if we don't want it to, even if we didn't think it was influencing us. And I think you'll see that cultural shifts will occur in part because of that. In the case of Welsh tribes and now kingdoms in that period, their influence from the Normans, they began a massive castle construction, which really didn't exist before that. Because if you look in the history of, of fortifications in Britain, and specifically in Wales, before the invasion of the Normans, castles really were not a thing. And they become much more important after this, the establishment of the Normans, the building of the Mott and Bailey castles in South Wales, and the influence that has on the kings of Gwynedd and Doithbarth and other places. They all of a sudden get excited about building fortifications, building castles, and it becomes important to them. And I think that's an interesting side effect of this. It's not just a case of influence of culture from the day-to-day -day aspect, from your local average plowman, but also it influences you in military decisions and military ways of doing things, because as you come into conflict with these groups, you can see why their ways might work better than your ways. You know, your old Roman way of, of military and cavalry working together of the formations suddenly get destroyed because you have Anglo-Saxon groups who are creating an, a totally different dynamic, which collides against you and is easily able to defeat you, much like the Normans will come along again and change things again in how the Saxons are, are militarily able to deal with them. And part of the problems that they have with the Saxons and the Normans comes down to a difference in the way that they fight and how that develops and changes over time. And it's all very fascinating and all very interesting as we talk about these kind of things, because I think it gives us an opportunity to sort of feel how important they are to us and how much they give us in a way of understanding how the local populations worked, how they created and 
deferred from each other and how eventually they will come back to one another and come back into, you know, it, it comes down to the kings of Wales and the princes of Wales at the end of, of independence don't look very different than their English counterparts other than possibly their wealth. And I think that becomes an interesting example of what goes on. So I think for now we're going to leave that there. We're going to talk a lot more over the coming days or coming weeks about the Saxon and British dealings with one another as we get out of the 5th century and into the 6th. We get into more historical periods where there's more records more writings, more things to compare to, things that have some accuracy attached to them as opposed to guesswork, and less legendary discussions. But we are going to have one more legend to talk about. And next week, I'm hoping to talk about Arthur. And I know for some of you, this is going to be a difficult conversation. But bear with me. Keep with me. I'm telling you, by the end of this, hopefully, if I haven't changed your mind on the whole Arthur thing, at the very least, I'll give you something to think about, I hope. And uh, I, I will say that I think it's a very intriguing discussion. It goes back to that idea of the old days being better and what we think was the history of something versus what it may have actually have been and how that influences the politics and the personalities of the future when you look back at these past events and how they will influence us going forward. And I, it's an... Honestly, I think it's a very interesting discussion. I think it's worth talking about. But regardless, uh, as always, I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, I'd like to say that it was great talking to so many different people over the holiday season uh, about History of Wales. And, and I'm so grateful and glad that, you, that I've received so many compliments and, and suggestions and different things. And, and please, if you want to get a hold of me, want to talk to me, and I am very willing to talk back, you can reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod, or you can come and talk to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. Until next time, everyone, thank you. Have a great day. And let me just make one more suggestion to you to check out just as, as an aside before I end the show. My podcast group is called Distractions Media. I think they offer a lot of interesting things. It's not just history. Um, I would recommend you check them out, distractionsmedia.com. I participate in some stuff, but there are things that I'm not involved with, which are still really great. We do stuff on Twitch. We do stuff, especially podcasts, which are not history-related, uh, but I think are a lot of fun and are very interesting things to do and, and to listen to, and hopefully you'll consider checking some of it out it's it's well worth it if you're interested in especially rpg uh tabletop games like dungeon and dragons and things of that nature i think you'd find some of our stuff very interesting and we do talk about general things and general topics beyond history and beyond just uh, D, D. so thank you everyone have a great day and we'll talk to you later bye this has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.